So I guess Alabama LSU played last night. I had a guy sitting in front of me. He is at game six of the World Series. The Astros are in a position to clinch. There is Pena's on first, Altuve's on third, Jordan comes up. Where is this guy? He's sitting in his chair like this, trying to watch the Alabama LSU game. <laughs> Jordan hits the home run. The crowd goes wild. He goes, and goes right back to his phone. Dude, sell the freaking ticket. I mean, come on. Talk about not living in the moment. Anyway, all right, y'all. It's the first week in November. It's the, we've, we've got done with trunk or treat and Halloween. So, of course, the next holiday is Christmas. No, wait. Well, isn't that the way our society kind of works? Isn't that what it all of a sudden starts focusing on? It's all of a sudden, it's, it's Christmas. But you know what? There's this little thing in between called Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Giving, And that's why we're starting this new series here in November, Give Thanks. Give Thanks. Because this should be the month that we celebrate thanks. Now, we've turned Thanksgiving into this holiday that is this big meal where extended family that we barely tolerate comes over. I mean, extended family we don't get to see often comes over. And we make this big meal, and we eat this huge meal, and then we go sit in front of the big TV and fall asleep watching football. And we've missed the point of Thanksgiving. We've missed the point of Thanksgiving. We've turned it, call it Thanksgiving, but it's really about giving thanks. It's about giving thanks. And this November, we want to focus on giving thanks to God on a day-to-day -day basis for the things that he's given us for the things that we need to focus on and be thankful for every day. There's this old song by Frederick Lehman, and it goes like this. It says, the love of God is far greater than the tongue or pen will ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Love the first line. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen will ever tell. God's love is so immense, it's so incredible, there's not enough words to describe it. There's, there's not enough words to speak it. There's not enough ink in the world and pages that have been printed to write it all down. And we have a tendency to forget that because we all struggle with it. We know it. We know God loves us and we know his love. If you're a Christian especially, man, you've trusted Christ and at that moment, man, you feel it because most of the time we were having some type of personal experience or there was something we were going through and, and man, we feel it. We felt it. We felt God just kind of come over as the Holy Spirit just be there and we feel God's love and there's that great moment and then we wake up the next day and we get on with life and we know about God's love and we read about God's love but sometimes we tend to forget about God's love. And so that's what we're going to look at today because everyone struggles with this truth. I struggle with this truth. We have to remember Satan is the father of lies and he wants us to believe that, here's the thing, and this is what's so funny, God's always, Satan always tells half-truths. See, God, Satan wants you to believe that God loves everybody but you. God loves everybody else but you. Because you know what you've done, and he knows what you've done. And, and so, you know, if anybody else, and God really realizes what, what you've done, God's love works for everybody else but you. And that's how we feel at times. And that is a lie from Satan himself. See, Satan wants us to be shackled with all this stuff. He wants us to be shackled with guilt, but God's word tells us real clearly, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. If you have, you've trusted Christ, you're free. You're free. You're justified before him. There's no, when you stand before him and, and you got all this guilt and stuff of what you've done, he's like, no, Christ paid that debt. You are free. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We can be shackled by shame, shame of those things that we've done. When the Pharisees brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus, and all the Pharisees and all the people picked up stones to stone her, man, the, Jesus, the first thing Jesus said was, hey, whoever here hasn't screwed up, whoever here hasn't messed up, whoever, has, whoever here hasn't sinned, go ahead. You get to throw the first stone. One by one, they dropped them. 
I love it. The older said the older ones first. Why? Because they, really, they had a lot more time to mess up than the younger ones. One by one, they dropped their stones. And God's word tells us that Jesus asked her, who condemns you? And she said, no one. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus is the only one that can tell you to go and sin no more. That's why I always tell you to go out and sin a little less. I don't have the power to tell you that. But the bottom line is this. The Son sets you free. And if He has set you free, you are, many translations says, you are free indeed. What it means is if the Son sets you free, you really will be free. You just got to trust it and accept it and go with it. Maybe something else has you shackled. Maybe it's bitterness and resentment. Man, you know what bitterness and resentment is? That's like drinking poison and expecting everybody else to die. It's not how it works. But Ephesians, Paul writes, says, get rid of bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. And instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. How? Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Just as God through Christ has been given you. Some of us are shackled by insecurity. Some of you are wondering, sometimes people, you wonder, you know, okay, I've trusted, but am I really saved? Am I, am I saved, but have I done enough? Or, 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 you know, maybe I've done this. Does that disqualify me or whatever? And that man, Satan, uses that against us constantly. Oh, man, you screwed up. Are you really saved? Would a Christian really do that? Look what God's Word says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Say that with me. Yes. Never perish. What does the word never mean? Never. never. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I love that line. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. You've seen me use this illustration before. You all got a penny today. I want you to take that penny. Get out your penny. I have here a half dollar. Y'all have pennies. I went to the World Series last night. I can't afford to give y'all all half dollars. <laughs> but have you ever had a two, have y'all ever had little kids, like two-year-olds? I remember one time when Braden was little. He's about two. And he bent down, we were at a playground or something, and he bent down and picked something up off the ground. I don't remember even what it was, but he picked it up off the ground. And you know, sometimes what they pick up tends to go to their mouth. And so I ran over, I'm like, give me that, give me that. And Brayden, he, that little two-year-old hand clutched around it. I could not hardly pry his fingers open to get to this, like, I think it was a half-eaten French fry that somebody had dropped on the ground. But this is a picture, y'all. No one will snatch them out of my father's hand. I want you to take that coin. I want you to put it in your right hand. I want you to hold on to it like this. See, that's you. If you have trusted Christ, that is you. Now, if you want to have somebody try to pry that penny out of your hand, you know how difficult that is? Man, whenever you're feeling insecure, whenever you're not feeling loved, whenever you have doubt, take that penny, put it in your hand, hold it out like this, and then dare somebody to try to pull it out of your hand. And you think that's tough? You think that's almost impossible? That's the word picture. If you are here with Jesus Christ in your life, you feel his love. It is impossible for anyone or anything to snatch you out of his hand. Remember that. But that is so hard for so many of us to grasp. It might be hard for you to grasp because Satan loves to poke you with all this stuff. And because he pokes us with it and because we get down, because we forget who we are and who loves us, Sometimes we, we put the coin down ourselves. And at those times, it can be tough to remember to give thanks. But here's the good news, y'all. Here's the thing. That's this. The gospel, the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that not only has Jesus saved you from hell, but he saved you from hell hell. That's what he saved you from, but he saved you to a life worth living. Because without Jesus, all this is is live, work, eat, pay taxes, do it again until you die. Well, that's a really lovely thought, isn't it? But that's the point. 
because Jesus has saved you, not just from hell on the other side of eternity, but he saved you to a life worth living on this side of eternity. And so today we're going to talk about, in this series we're going to talk about things to give thanks for on a daily basis. Today we're going to look at giving thanks for God's love. Giving thanks for God's love. Now that subject can be confusing sometimes because we think of love as being an emotional thing. But love is a decision based on commitment. Let me say it again. Love is a decision based on commitment. It is not a feeling. Feelings come and go. Love is a commitment. It's like when you get married. Love is a commitment. There are times that you will fall out of love. Me and Mom have been married 30 years. Trust me, there's times she hasn't loved me. <laughs> I will do something stupid and I will look at her and I will later on say, Molly, I messed up. Please forgive me. I love you. And she goes, I forgive you and I tolerate you. Because <laughs> she lost that love and feeling. She'll get it back. She usually does in time. But love is a decision. It's not an emotion. And Romans 5, great passage to help us understand God's love and how he demonstrates his love to us and how we can be secure in our life on this side of eternity because of God's great love for us. And that's what we need. We need security. Because I know that's one of the greatest gifts you can give somebody you love is security. Because when people feel love, they thrive. I know my family, when they feel love, when they're secure, they thrive. When everything's taken care of, when they know, okay, even if there's bad times, even if there's trouble, even if there's sickness, they always knew in our family unit, they were secure. They could come home and they'd be loved and there'd be safety and security. That's what God provides for us. So today we're going to look at how he shows his commitment of love to us and gives us security. Three basic things we're going to look at today. Before we jump in, let's pray. Father, thank you again for this morning and the opportunity we have to gather together to dig into your word. We thank you for your, your incredible love that at times we tend to forget because life comes at us. Satan throws things at us. Our sin gets in the way. We doubt ourselves. But that's not the truth. The truth is you sent your son to die for us. You loved us that much, and that love goes on on a daily basis through everything we go through. In fact, many of the things we go through, you allow us to go through, as we're going to see, because you love us. Because you love us. And so, Father, we just pray today as we look at your word, you help each of us have a thankful heart so that during the week and moving forward, as the trials and tribulations, as this life comes at us, that doubt seeps in. We can always give thanks because we know you are always there, always for us, always loving us. So we thank you for the opportunity we have today to examine that, to look at it, and make that truth even more firmer in our life. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Look at Romans 5 today. It's our jump off point for the passage today. And Romans 5 says this. Romans is basic theology. Romans 5, Paul is talking about God's great love for us. He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about God's love, but we're going to glory in tribulations? Yes, because we glory in the tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. There's a process that we go through. And now hope does not disappoint because the, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We're going to break that down and look at each of us. The bottom line is this, that God shows us his love in his presence. God shows us his love by just his presence in our lives. Now, if we're going through something, we got to remember that God is present. And that's half the time. That's our issue, is that we're going through stuff and we go, God, where are you? Here's the thing. If you don't feel close to God, God's not the one that's moved. You're the one that's moved. God's always there. It's just that, are we in tune? Are we so focused on ourselves, our issues, that we don't feel his presence? Now, we think, well, you know, if God could just physically be there with us, you know, if I could really have Jesus just right there with me. Well, look, let me give you an example. You think if Jesus was right there with you, it would be any different? Let me show you an example from the, the, uh, the apostles, the gospels. Luke, maybe you know this story. One day, Jesus says to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So I believe they were at the Sea of Galilee, and so they needed to get to the other side. So they got in a boat, and they started across the lake. 
So, so they got in the boat, they started out, and as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. He had been teaching. So you guys go, I'm just going to go here in the back of the boat. I'm just going to take a quick cat nap or whatever. But soon a fierce storm came down the lake, and the boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. So here we go. They're going across Sea of Galilee, the winds, if you've ever been there. I haven't been there. I want to go so bad. I think we're going to do that in a, uh, sometime next year. Is that right, Scott? December of 23, we're going to do a Israel trip. So we'll, we'll be telling you more about that in the future. I've never been, but my father-in-law would tell me about it. He's been multiple times. So the winds there at the Sea of Galilee with the mountains and stuff around it, everything could be calm. And then all of a sudden you get a, a front blow through and it's like the wind whips up and just, it can go from, from calm to raging in a matter of minutes. And apparently that's what happened. So they're there, then the waves are crashing, they're being tossed up and down, water is flooding in the boat. Oh my gosh, we're through this terrible time. Here we go. Oh my God. God. And we, Jesus is what? He's still over here asleep. Now don't we feel like that sometimes when we're going through tr stuff, we're going through trials, we're going through tribulations, we've got sickness, we've got situations going on. And you're like, where are God? Are you just asleep in the boat? Man, we feel like that sometimes. But he knows what's going on. Look what happens. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And when Jesus woke up, he basically, he just woke up, oh, rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and the storm stopped and all was calm. Now, when you think about that, you ever been, you know, waves, you know, when you were a kid, did you ever do rock the pool? Did y'all do that? I grew up in Shenandoah, and we do a thing called rock the pool, and we would all, do, all get up the line, we'd get about 15 boys. And we'd all get on the line, go off the diving board, and start doing cannonballs. And everybody would go in doing cannonballs. Left, center, right. Left, center, right. And we'd just do that for like 10 minutes. And the pool would just be, I mean, the waves in the pool. It looked like a storm. I mean, literally, it would be jumping down below the, below the tile and coming up. And finally, the lifeguards would be like, okay, blow the whistle. Enough! Stop it! And we'd stop. And it would take 15, 20 minutes for the pool, for the pool to... Get back to normal. Jesus rebuked the wind and the raging waves. The storm stopped and all was calm. Jesus went, enough. And it just went dead calm. That's God, y'all. That's God. And in that calm moment, when it's like it went from just, ah! and they're all looking at each other like, What? Jesus asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed and said, who is this man? When he gives the command, even the wind and waves obey him. Well, that's the man you have in your life. That's the individual who loves you so much, so much. And this lets us know that, you know, when you're going through all the junk you're going through, and some of you are dealing with stuff right now, sickness, health, relation issues, financial issues. You're going through it, kid issues, whatever it is. God is right there. He is right there with you in the storm. Right there with you. And I know it's stressful, but the bottom line is you can relax because God's got it. God's got it. Because through this, he promises never to Never to leave us or forsake us. Hebrews, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. See, so many times our problems, see, money's not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that can be the root of all evil. And so many times we focus on finances. We focus on material things. We, we stress out over this stuff. We cause so much of the problems in our life. And that's what he's saying. Keep your lives free from that. Don't make yourself stressed out. Don't bring it on yourselves. Be content with what you have. God says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? I got God on my side. I got God on my side. You know, we have a temptation when bad things happen. We think Satan messes with us. We think, man, when something's bad's happened, God's punishing me for something. You ever think that? You know, I did, you know, I, three years ago, I, I got mad at the clerk at a store. I didn't leave a tip. I, I, I cussed out my kids when I got mad a couple, about a week ago. And now my car won't start. God's punishing me. There's a theological word for that. 
baloney. That's not how it works. That's not how God works. God doesn't care about me. Well, I think we've just proven that over and over again. This is just how my life is going to be from now on. Oh, suck it up, Debbie Downer. <laughs> Don't give me that woe is me stuff. God is there. He loves you. Why? Do, but why do these bad things happen? Why am I having tribulation? Why do I have problems? Romans 8, 28. All things work to good. All things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purposes. Not your purposes, His purposes. His purposes. See, we go through trouble, we go through problems, we go through trials, and God gets an opportunity to show off. There was no miracle of the calming of the sea without a raging storm in the lives of the disciples. The bad stuff that happens gives God an opportunity to show up big time in our lives. Opportunity to do great things in our lives. Seeing that we get to then boast about that God did. We talk all the time about, got our 12 year anniversary last, last week. Talk a little bit about the campus and the property and the building. And man, and I, you know, can I, do you, know, do you brag on this? You dang right I brag on this place. And I brag on y'all and what God has done through you. But it's not saying it's about us. It's like, we're not going, yep, we did this. We got this property. We built this. Building. No, God did this through us. When I talk about this building, this property, you guys, I'm not boasting about us. I'm not bragging about us. I'm bragging everybody about what God is doing in this church and in this body. Amen. That's what it's about. And that's what we do. Here's the thing. The world isn't impressed with your theology. It's not impressed with your biblical knowledge. It's not impressed with you correcting people. The world doesn't care. The bottom line is this. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. When they see God do great things through you, through your trials, your tribulations, your troubles, he shows off. And it gives you an opportunity to then speak into their life, to build a relationship with them, for them to go, man, I'm doing this, I'm struggling with this. How did you make it through this? How did you make it through this relational issue? How did you make it through this financial crisis? How did you make it through when your kids did this? How did you make it through when you lost your job? How did you make it through all this stuff? And you get to go, my God helped me through. My God carried me through. My faith Help me deal with this medical crisis, deal with this financial crisis, deal with this relational issue. And it gives God a chance to show off and for you to brag on him. And then you get to share Jesus with that person. Because you see, we are so loved by God that we can then show that love to others. Here's the second thing. God shows his love by developing my character. This one kind of hurts, y'all. Do anybody play sports? Everybody play sports? Have to dance, do karate, anything like that. Anything with a coach? This is my coach's hat. I used to coach Cobra football. Cobra six-man football. The guys loved me and hated me at the same time. Because I was the guy that would do the drills, and like the tackling drills, and the stretches, and, the, and all this stuff. And it's like there'd be times it's like, oh, yeah, we got to run. All right, we're running. Now we're running more. We're running gassers. We're running laps. We're running this. Had one kid, it's like we run through. I said, okay, you got to run. We're going to do 40 yard, 40 yard dashes. You got to run all the way past me, all the way through me. Anybody that run all the way past me, we're doing it again. And there was one kid that he'd get about five yards from me and he'd pull up and I'd take the hat, boom, it goes. Because they knew whenever the hat came off and went flying, it wasn't going to be good. And the hat would come off my head. It would go flying like we're going again. <gasps> And here we go, we'd go again. That kid, like five times in a row, he pulled up five, 10 yards from the start. The hat goes, everybody's mad. Why are you doing it, coach? Why do you run us, coach? Why do we run the same drills over and over each week? Why do we run the same play over and over and over again? Because I'm working on your character. I'm working on muscle memory. I'm preparing you for the game. I used to have to say, you play like you practice. If you, if you, and I, I told the kid that, if you practice like crap, you're going to play like crap. And one week we had a terrible practice. And they got killed. 
And the same mistakes they did in practice, they repeated them in the game. And they came and looked at me and they finally went, oh, we get it. Because you practice. Your practice prepares you for the game situation. God let you go through trials and tribulations and junk, whether they're relational or physical, emotional, financial. Half the time they're freaking imagined in our head. But he lets you go through that to train you for high-stress situations. Watching the Astros last night, one of the things the sportscasters talk about, whenever there's guys on base, it's the World Series, it's a playoff, there's guys on base, the pitcher's on the mound. They call those high-stress pitches. Now, if there's nobody on base, you've got the lead, man, you can throw whatever you want. If, man, if you miss a pitch, if you walk a guy, it's no big deal. But if you're only up by a run, or you're down by a run, all of a sudden, their big guy Harper or Schwarber or whatever comes up, so you watch the game. You got to throw to that guy with a runner on and you're only up by one run. Those are called high stress pitches. They practice and practice and practice for those situations. So when that comes up, they're prepared. They know what to do. God allows trials and tribulation to little things in our life for when we have to make high stress pitches. When the real trials, when the real tribulations, when the real things come, that we are better able to handle it because we've been through similar situations before. And he's got us through this time, and he got us through this time, and he got us through this time, and this thing that I'm going now that's major, that's big, he's going to get me through that too. Well, how do you know that? Because he's prepared me along the way in other high-stress situations for such a time as this. The world says we're going to have troubles and tribulation. That's why. John 16, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In our times of tribulation and stress, it's God's love gives us peace, knowing that he has us and he will get us through it. He will get us through it. Adversity in our life, it defines us and it refines us at the same time. I love this saying. I think Scott said this one time. Desperation will lead to dependence. Dependence leads to God's deliverance. Your desperation in your life, when you can't do it, when everything in your life, you, you don't know what to do, you don't know the next move, there's nothing you can do to solve the issue, the problem, whatever you're going through your life, that's when you have to lean on God. And God allows you to be in those situations so that you can develop your dependence and your faith in Him. And that's what it's about. And when you depend on God, that leads to God's delivering you from those situations. Here's the other thing is this. Character grows best in the soil of adversity. Character grows best in the soil of adversity. If you've never been tested, never been pushed, when the big things come, you will crumble like a house of cards. And how many times do you see people do that? They just kind of go happy, go lucky life. And then when something happens, something major, they just fall apart. Because they haven't been working, they haven't been depending on God, they haven't been tested. They haven't been tested. James makes it clear, he says, my brethren, let me stop there, my brethren, the word brethren there is Adelphos, and it means born of the same two parents or having one of the same parents. So James, he's saying, my brethren, as in we are brothers, brothers in the family of God, Christ. So he is talking to Christians. My brethren, fellow Christians, fellow believers, count it all joy when, now wait a minute, when. What does when mean? It's going to happen. Not if it happens, not it could happen. Consider it all joy when, i.e. is coming. You fall into various trials. Meaning you're going to fall into various trials. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean God puts his bubble around you and everything's fine. Anybody that tells you, well, a real Christian wouldn't experience, a real Christian wouldn't get sick, a real Christian wouldn't have this happen, a real Christian wouldn't, you know, you must be have some sin in your life. Theological word. Baloney. Christians experience trials on this side of eternity. But knowing 
that the testing of your faith, which is what this is, it's a testing of your faith, produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may perf be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. What he's saying is trials refine your faith. They prepare you for the big stuff in life. They prepare you for the game. They prepare you for the high stress pitches that you're going to have to make in this life. Because it's real easy. Let me tell you all this. It's real, you know people that brag about their faith? I've had people that they brag, I, oh, I love Jesus. I have so much faith. I do this. I do that. They bragged about their faith. And then I found out years later, it's like, what happened? Oh, they're, they're, they're done. They don't follow church. They're not in the ministry. They're not doing anything more. Well, what happened? Oh, well, wife got sick. They had a financial crisis. They had this or that happened. But wait a minute. They talked, they talked this big game about their faith. See, it's easy to talk about your faith, but it's a lot harder when you have to put your faith into action. In sports, we say prove it on the field. I remember we had guys, I remember guys that would talk a big game. Oh man, I'm a great quarterback. I'm a great receiver. I can do this. I can do that. I can hit a ball. I'll do that. Okay, let's play a game. And then you find out they're butterfingers. Worst thing you could do is hit them in the hands with the ball. Worst thing you could do is hit a ball to them. Couldn't hit a curveball, a fastball, a slider, anything. They talked a big game, but when you put them on the field, they couldn't produce. God is saying he tests our faith on a regular basis so that when the big things happen, when we're on the field, when life comes at us, we can produce. We're prepared. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Count it all joy when you follow the various trials. Know that the testing and that testing of your faith don't make any means proving that by which something is tried or proved. God uses the trials to allow us to prove to the world that our faith is real. Because world sees Christians talk a big game, but they got to see you prove it. They got to see it in action. And that's what develops our faith skill. That's what develops our character. Lastly, God, this, that he shows us his love by giving us the Holy Spirit. That moment you accept Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes into your life. It's a one-time thing. There's not a second, third filling, third filling, fourth filling, fifth filling, any of that stuff. Now, there are times that you kind of walk away from God. It's like that person that's there and you ignore them. And then when you need them, all of a sudden you notice them again. That's what happens to a lot of people. It's like, man, I really felt the Holy Spirit. Where was he? He was there the whole time. You're just ignoring him. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. But God gives us the Holy Spirit. Look at this. It's John. This is Jesus talking. He said, I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. He what? What's the word? Remains. He doesn't come and go. He's always there. Like I said, if you don't feel close to him, he ain't the one that moved. He remains with you and will be in you. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. And in a little while, while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. This is Jesus again talking. Because I live, you will live too. And on that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am with you. Now the word helper there. Some of your translations, you're following along. If you've got your Bibles open, it says some say helper, some say counselor, some say advocate, some say comforter. Now we think counselor and we're thinking, oh, that person that listens to us and that gives us advice. The word counselor there, it's parakletos, par, 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 whatever, par, yeah, parakeet, whatever. Parakletos means one summit or called to one side, to one's aid. But here's the key. It's one who pleads another cause before a judge, a pleader, a counselor for defense, legal assistant, an advocate, one who pleads another's cause with one, an intercessor. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He is an intercessor between us and God. It says, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us. There's groanings. Sometimes I think the greatest prayer I ever prayed, I was so frustrated about something as a relational thing. I was so frustrated. My prayer went something like this. Ah! And this verse basically tells me that God understood that. 
because the Holy Spirit translated it for me. That's what he is, the counselor, the advocate, the person that goes between us and God. When we don't know what to pray, when we don't know what we need, he is there. He is there. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. And within that moment, when I prayed that ah, prayer, that about three scriptures that I hadn't read in years popped into my head. How did that happen? The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or be fearful. Here's the thing. Insecurity in life arises when we're not taught about the Holy Spirit. We, do, we don't remember God's love. When we try to go through life living on our own, and Satan wants you to do that. He wants you to be ignorant of the truth. He wants you to just kind of be out there in la-la land, and then when trials come to fall apart, to forget about God's love in your life. Challenge of the week is this. Two things. First, fo focus on God's love through life's trials, tribulations, and adversity. That's what you got to do. you got to focus on God's love. When the trials come, focus on how much God loves you. When adversity comes, focus on what God has put you through before and how he sustained you through that, knowing that if he got you through that one, he'll get you through this one. Last thing is this. Remember who holds you in his hand. Remember. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. I always keep a little change in my pocket for that reason. I used to have a quarter, a penny, or something. And it's one of those things that's like, you know, I feel, you know, one of those days, things coming on, adversity, trials. Where I can always just stick my hand in my pocket. I don't have to pull it out. I can just wrap my hand around that coin, that penny, that nickel, whatever is in my pocket. I can just wrap my hand around it. I can make a fist. And it's a reminder, okay, God, you got me. You got me. And if you got me, then I got this then I got this. Thankful that you love me so much that you got me, so I got this. Remember, the love of God is far greater than tongue or pen will ever tell, goes beyond the highest stars, reaches to the lowest hell. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you hold each and every one of us in your mighty right hand. That you love us so much that you will not let go and that if we are yours, if we have trusted Christ and placed our faith in him, that there is nothing, nothing that can pull us away from you. Nothing can pull us away from you. Help us remember that. And during this time of year, this month, give thanks for you. Give thanks for your love, your graces. Give thanks for the trials and tribulations that you are using to test our faith, because I know it's difficult now, but man, just like that baseball or football practice or piano or whatever it is we did, that we didn't know why we were doing it. And yet when it came time to play, we knew what to do. Help us remember our trials and tribulations that we're going through today. Are you preparing us for the big game that we get there? We will know exactly what to do, and we will get through that one like everything else. Again, Father, thank you for your love, your grace, and your son, Jesus Christ. It's his name we pray. Amen.